So continuing this evening with, um, what do I call our, I want to say followers, with our sangha, with everybody who's with us together on this journey, we have a message from A. Honda. A. Honda writes, think of the galaxy as potentiality. Some of us have skipped about 80 million years to arrive in this paradigm between microseconds while the experience has taken about 10 years. The sun is a good and faithful servant. I anticipate the next phase of the sun to be blue, I hope, before it returns to yellow. One thing to realize, if one hopes to escape to an improved paradigm or parallel universe, the outer and inner still maintains a balance. Even if one thinks they have successfully time traveled into the future, perhaps two years ahead of an event, one realizes they've arrived two years too late to do anything about it. Uh, hey Honda, I responded to you, time does not exist. And I think it's really important to talk about these parallel universes and sequences of time. You know, Einstein said time is curved. I said, let's go beyond that. Time is entangled. Time is encrypted. You know, Einstein said time is curved. I said, it's time to go beyond that. Time is entangled. Past, present, future are one time. So actually this is, hey, Honda said, sometimes when you arrive at something, it's already happened. Sometimes the past has already happened or what's already happened, we have to find out in the past. So if we start to think in this way, we come back to really a core teaching of a lotus born master, that time in itself does not exist. And by the way, what time is it? Uh, okay, we're gonna continue with our next one here. Hang on, uh, we've got a message from Celso Loza, who writes, I find it intriguing how great minds like William Reich talked about these beings when he discovered org orgone energy, and also the great resemblance between these demons and the macrobes from John D. studies with mediums. All leads us toward becoming a macrobe or awakening our superconscious, is what I call. I got one of those knives around my neck for ages and also always carry a crystal around my neck for very similar reasons. As explained in the documentary, this knowledge is here for anyone to get to. But I love it that you have it on film. Thank you so much. And Celso, thank you for adding William Reich because we're actually gonna be talking about him in a future production. And uh, we wanna share some knowledge about William Reich because I think it's really important. William Reich, and I have here a book of his that was actually copied from me because his writings are, you know, they were burned actually. They were burned um, by federal agents back, I guess, in the 1920s or so when he was uh, working with, um, first he was a student, a disciple of Sigmund Freud, but he went beyond Sigmund Freud because he started to work with sexual energy. And he looked at sex as not a taboo thing, not a bad thing, not something to be um, linked to ethic morals, but he actually looked at the potency of human energy, or what we call in you know chi energy, uh, the shakti energy when it's working with the shiva energy, these you know the yin and the yang when they're working together, and how this energy can have a huge combustion, and it's very much related to some of the teachings that we've talked about or touched upon in our films. We're gonna go into far more detail with that in the Dakini Code, which will be looking at Tantra practice in a very, um, uh, we say, scientific way. And um, both from the perspective of religious philosophy, but also from the perspective of science. And William Wright was using this energy for people to do self-cure and also to affect weather conditions, often using copper wires, very similar to the effect that a purva has in conducting energy from the mind, from the body, from the universal space into an energy field that can actually bring about outcomes by carrying your intention on a frequency wave. And I think William Reich did amazing things 
with his work. He had an entire center up in Maine. Sigmund Freud didn't really like where he went. He said, you've gone too far in terms of busting the establishment. The established views are conservative about sex, about morals. We are starting to, you know, harness this as an energy. And of course, ultimately, he was closed down by the federal agents. He was put into jail where he died and his work was actually burned. And a few of his disciples, students brought his work to Europe where it was republished. And that's why we have access to some of his studies and research. I think what's really important is to understand that the human body has a lot of capacity to cure itself. It has a lot of ability to be able to generate energy that we often don't generate. We outsource our minds to computers. We outsource a lot of our energy to other things. But I think in coming back to that, many of these scientific discoveries of someone like William Wright were actually known to ancient people a long, long time ago. And as we see in our films, we're revealing that these methods, technologies actually existed and were able to benefit people. Now maybe it's time that we bring together some of these spiritual practices with modern science and technology. Stop thinking that these things are separate. Understand the links and interactions and harness them for the betterment of the planet. Imagine what would happen if energy was free, if health was free. And I think that's probably why they suppressed William Reich's work, because he was making these things available to people for free. And of course, you know, the big oil companies, they influence government, they have a lot of power and also pharma companies. And so he was bucking the establishment. It's time for people to take back the power into their minds, into their bodies. Be at one with yourself and the planet. At any rate, thank you, Selza. You brought a lot to our attention by talking about William Reich. And let's see. Philip Howard has written The hidden awareness of natural perfection is everywhere. Natural perfection is the here and now, naturally present, without speech or books, irrespective of conceptual clarity or dullness. It is spontaneous joyful creativity, its reality is nothing at all. And Phil, I can't add to that because you have articulated that so beautifully. I just wanted to share it with everybody else. So Philip Howard, thank you so much. And we're sharing your words, poetry, with everyone else because I think you said all we need to say. Horace Hollow has written, Hey Shambhala Films, great work with this, but you missed the important part from Patan Nepal. There is a Mahabihar of Shakyas named Yempi Mahabihar. That place is where Guru Padmasambhava and Dakini Vajrayogini stay. It is also said that lots of knowledge scripts are gifted to the Shakyas of that Mahabihar. You missed a lot from it. Although great work and great documentary. And then Rahul Magar writes, yes, the Yebi Mahabihar has lots of positive energies. It should be included. And I wrote back, thank you guys. This is really great insight. Please give us a contact. We want to know more. We want to go there. I have not been there. And we have to go there and include it in a future film. So any of you that have leads, ideas, places to add, you know, we're explorers, so we're always looking and searching and trying to discover. We don't have all the answers. We're searching. And so if there are any clues, share them with us. You can also write to us at our Shambhala Studio um, directly, our email. Our Shambhala Studio team will also get in touch with you if you write to us on our YouTube channel and follow up with information. Um, don't write to the website because then that goes into my email box. And I'll be very honest with you, I don't read emails, you know, so I'm kind of on the field. I like to look at, you know, stars and trees and 
rivers and mountains, so I often don't read emails. Sometimes everybody gets angry at me because I don't do that, but too bad. Anyway, um, that's how we make more films. So let's go on. And uh, your ideas are always welcome. Um, Dagmar Lana writes just a few days ago, did not like face recognition data. AI, future is here and it's dark time to leave this planet. And I know what he's talking about in our first film of the series, Searching for the Lotus Born Master. Every time someone speaks, we have this kind of zzzz come out as a face recognition. We were really just playing with the idea to try to show technology or there's, you know, that really the traditional wisdom has a lot of knowledge of the technology is just catching up to it. We're trying to present that idea by using the face recognition. And really, it's a way of, you know, juxtaposing traditional ancient ideas against where we are with our cutting edge technology to say that maybe the cutting edge technology is catching up with the ancient philosophy. So I just responded to Dagmar, the technology can be used positively or negatively. It all depends upon our mind. We determine how it can be used. So if we want to change the use of technology out there in a more positive way, like for environment. Technology is very important now with a lot of green energy because that relies on vast amounts of data. Let's put our energy on that and not on this technology, social medias that are creating anger with people and frustration and all these things. This is not where we should be putting the energy. So we have to tell the people at the capital markets who are behind the technology because uh, they need to do something about the planet rather than just, you know, do something about their bank accounts. Anyway, let's see what's going on here. We have Naya Karyal. Hi, Lawrence from Boulder, Colorado. Love your movies. They are magical, intelligent, interdimensional, wise, beauty, and full of love. May your journey be guided by light of the highest frequencies. Much appreciation. And I want to thank you, Naya, for writing to us. Yes, the light of these frequencies is our guide. And I want to tell you that I have great memories of Boulder. It's a great Boulder, Colorado. It's a great Buddhist community. I love to visit it anytime. Anytime you have a chance to invite me, I'll come. Um, I was at the pleasure a few years ago. There's a World Affairs Conference every year at the University of I think it's Colorado at Boulder. And, um, you know, there's some great minds that come there, exchange ideas, and had the pleasure to uh, visit, of course, the Shambhala Center in Naropa University, where there's some really great stuff going on and benefiting a lot of people. And Boulder, yeah, that is a real energy center. The uh, First Nations people, the Native Americans, all knew that. And I'm glad that all of you are there. Um, Tap into that energy. And, bringing it out to everybody else through uh, channels like Shamala Center and Naropa University. Um, great place to be. Thank you for writing and bringing back some very, very fond memories of Boulder. 